Hi, welcome to the Bullshift News and the Mavstar Observatory. Guys, I've been busy this week, that's why you probably haven't seen so many videos being uploaded to YouTube. Um, trying to get a little bit of headway on the uh, cloud generator. So, uh, we'll get into this, what we're looking at at the moment. It's all about building a better prediction model and understanding really how all these anomalies tie into each other, such as volcanic activity with um, planetary magnetics. So. As always, I'd just like to say big thanks to those few people, always a few people, that are putting some support into what we do at the observatory. As you guys know, we've got nearly five out of the six first magnetometers out in the locations, and over in the next few days we'll be collecting some data back off these people around the world, uh, Australia, America, and soon we'll get some data coming from Hong Kong, and we'll be you know, relaying that back up to the website, and you can see what's going on with these high intensity regions over the north and southern areas of our planet. I've been spending a bit of time this week looking into a possible connection with you know, um, global core temperatures uh, with regards to volcanic activity and you know, the magnetic uh, high intense regions. Because as you can see guys, um, you can see all around the equatorial region is probably the most active region on our planet for volcanic activity. It is also, I don't think by any coincidence, a region uh, where these volcanoes are in actual eruption and we only look at the ones that are in eruption, not the ones that are active because there would be more active ones. We're looking at the ones that are actually, you know, producing, um, you know, lava flows and things like that. So, you know, we only concentrate on the ones that are in eruption. Um, and there's a good reason for that. It's because if you compare uh, this map of the active volcanoes on the left with one a couple of years ago, you're going to see that we're probably down on actual erupting volcanoes by about 30%. So that could give us an idea uh, as to what is probably going on. Now, you know, through a few experiments that I've conducted, um, magnetism uh, doesn't like to stay in its material too long when it starts to get into higher temperatures. Um, you might remember the experiment I've done where I put the nebidium magnet in an open fire and left it there and when we pulled it out it didn't even have the ability to attract the compass to the nebidium and it had lost completely all its magnetism. So I have an inkling that you know temperature can affect um, you know the magnetic poles and when we look at the active um, erupting volcanoes around the world we see that they are in the places where the lowest magnetic field is so it would say that the core is probably hotter in that region especially when we look at um, where we've got M8 on this map on the magnetic chart on the right uh, you'll see that we're looking at the South Atlantic anomaly which is the region of the planet with the lowest uh, magnetic field and is growing so it seems to fit but I think there's more work to be done on that. But I think if we can draw a conclusion out of it, you know, we can predict what is going to happen in the future as the poles, you know, uh, progress in their migration with relationship to active volcanoes. Because as you can see, all these volcanoes are in regions of the Earth where the magnetism is lowest. If you can compare all around Australia, you can see that, you know, on some of the continents around Australia, um, that the uh, are around three or four active volcanoes but if you look on the magnetic chart you'll see that those, um, those active volcanoes are at the regions of the high intense magnetic fields on this earth and I don't think it's by any coincidence that over the northern and southern hemispheres we see the actual lowest amounts of active volcanoes so that's what I've been looking at this week guys again if we compare the global temperature map on the left with the magnetic um, field strength map on the right you can see that there's a almost an identical pattern albeit that magnetic intensity that comes up over Australia towards Australia isn't really being shown out in the trend on the temperature map there is a very very similar pattern evolving with regards to surface temperatures um, with magnetic um, high intense regions it's almost mirroring the same as what we saw uh, when we try and uh, you know compare core temperatures with um, active volcanoes, you know we can put I believe at some point when we understand a little bit more about these 
um, these models together and probably overlay all the information on them as well as weather anomalies that are taking place as well as other anomalies that are taking place on this earth and we'll get a better comparison again by doing this we may be able to build a probable uh, computer modeling system where we can you know put the uh, data in off these other anomalies and it could give us some inf more information as to what's going on with the magnetic poles of our planet and probably understand a little bit more about the relationship in which they all interplay because I do believe that the magnetic poles migrating over the last hundred years and more so over the last 30 years are what have changed the majority of the other anomalies that we see taking place on our planet and adding to that you know when you look at what's taking place with the solar cycles dropping off exponentially over the last three solar cycles the last 33 years or so um, I think that only adds uh, more hindrance to what is taking place on our planet. I think that's why a lot of people, especially climatologists, are struggling to be able to predict, you know, accurate weather systems. Now we know, uh, even from you know pilots now, that when they look at the um, data before they go out on their flights with regards to the jet streams, that they can actually change within a short space of time, and you know they have to work with that as as and when. Now. Just before I end the video, I want to quickly touch on the subject of cloud seeding because I know for a lot of people that are just coming into this uh, arena of information, you know, they're hearing about these things for the very first time. But there's nothing new about cloud seeding. There's two forms of it. You can make it rain by adding additives to the, uh, you know, the atmosphere or the air over the location you want it to rain on, or you can dry up those clouds so you get better weather. But it isn't new, um, you know. We have been spraying stuff from aircrafts for, you know, a good 60 years. Uh, back in Vietnam, they used an agent called Agent Orange to, you know, kill off all the crops and vegetation so that, you know, we could see um, what was going on on the ground uh, by, you know, just remove, remove, removing all that vegetation that's there. Um, it's not new, guys. You know, they are doing it pretty much in every country now. Um, you know, Russia recently did it uh, during its parade uh, on the 9th of May so that they had good weather um, places like Koh Samui do it really a lot uh, you know and they don't cover it up even you know they even announce to the public that they will be doing it at specific times but more than anything else guys I think the fact that we are now having to do this on our planet is testimony to the changes that are taking place remember 8 billion people or thereabouts on this planet right now and you know our technology is being pushed to the point where we are having to change our uh, weather so that we can get our crops out of the ground otherwise we end up with massive crop failures and you know there are some things that we cannot do I mean we cannot regulate the temperatures uh, in short spaces of time like we can you know um, dispersing clouds that are possibly going to you know flood the crops out or you know we can obviously dry those clouds up so that we get more favorable weather and those crops um, you know um, do well as a process of that but more than anything guys I think it's uh, the reality is is you know we have now found ourselves at a time where we cannot allow nature to do will take its normal course in order for us to get crops in and out of the ground we have to now rely on forcing the ground and you know sometimes I listen to ham radio around in my location because it's out in the uh, it's a rural location it's out in the countryside and you can hear the farmers uh, talking you know over the radio sometimes I, I was shocked this one day because it was like you know you couldn't have listened in on a conversation at a better time and it sounded to me like there was a couple of old farmers talking and they were saying, you know, they don't know how long they can, can, you know, continue forcing the ground to get the crops out, because there's no longer that, um, you know, benefit of allowing the crops, uh, sorry, the fields to recover for a little bit. They have to be in there and out there every single year now in order to keep the bills up. And one of the things we're going to see, I believe, 
uh, if we're not already hearing too many stories of this happening, is farmers going under because the crops failed probably one year and then the next year and as a result they didn't make up the payments or they had to take loans out to cover themselves for that bad year and then the next year they had a continued bad year and it put them out of business and th this is a big risk uh, I know that there are insurance for these sorts of things for crop failures and things like that but if you keep claiming on these things it's not going to be long if you're a farmer before the insurance prices outweigh you know the benefits of having that insurance and you might be forced at that point in time then to start taking chances that you wouldn't normally this is just what is taking place in our world right now guys you know this is why me on this channel and a lot of other channels out there you know bring it on to you of the changes that are taking place and it's worrying because we see what happens when you get consecutive years of bad weather in countries and you end up with companies that produce seeds that are genetically modified and there's no need to mention the name but you know what I'm talking about that promise that these seeds are designed to grow in drier climates the farmers put them in there you know loaning the money to buy the seeds and the fertilizers that go with the seeds so that you know they can get this impressive crop and it's designed to be in either a wetter climate or a drier climate and guess what the climate changes and the guys lose the crop and as a result lose the farms and we've seen this over in India a hell of a lot farmers committing suicide because they've lost their uh, family lands that have been in the families for many many years it is a stark reality of the changes that are taking place on our earth and you know you aren't going to get many media outlets that are going to lay out quite simply like I just have there for you so you know it is a time where perhaps we need to start thinking about you know what we'll do if uh, you know these things start to come closer to home and trust me guys like I've said before they should already be at your door if you haven't noticed uh, the rising food prices over the last two years then you know check to see if you've still got a pulse you know fuel prices going up it's going up across the range guys and it is affecting us all already so you know it is now a time to be you know cautious and alert and you know educate yourself to what is going on and don't rely on you know our governments and our mainstream medias to inform you of that because it'll never happen it really won't so guys uh, in the next few days we're going to get some data uh, from our magnetometers uh, that are in the United States in Australia and it'll probably be another week before our one uh, actually lands in Hong Kong and we'll be hopefully doing a test run of that we are still looking for a placement in India for one of our magnetometers and if we can do that we've nailed the first six out of six in perfect locations tracking those high intense regions over the north and southern hemisphere and uh, as you guys know we're on to the uh, next thing there we want to finish off that cloud generator so we can actually see the cosmic rays going in it and then once we've got that finished yes guys we can take a deep breath and get on with that co2 laser transmitter and uh, i think that'll be an interesting um, project as well as you know continually uh, cycling in the data on the magnetic poles so i'll say what i usually do guys it would be great if we could really get some serious support for this observatory because we're doing more now than ever guys and the work is more now than ever you know the links are down there if you want to support us and there's also the patron if paypal's not for you whichever you know just show us a bit of support that's all and i'll catch up with you in a few days time so what i usually do enjoy your week bye for now